making heavy use of the tools that we developed last time. And what's interesting about today is that at the end of it all, um, much like last time, we're going to be able to just develop pictures that give an obvious picture of what's going on. Let me figure out where I am. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm right here. Okay. So, we know that we can now use the covariant derivative operation to take derivatives of tensors, and the result is a tensor. Exactly. That was our chief result, although we achieved a few other things along the way. You might ask, what good is this delta mu for, other than just taking the derivative of a tensor and getting a tensor? And it turns out it's, due to, it's, it's useful for quite a few other things. For example, since the derivative is basically taking the value of something at two infinitesimally separated points and then dividing by the distance between them. That's the definition of the derivative. This derivative operator is giving us information as to how to compare vectors at two different points in space, which if you think about it, is non-trivial. Because the vectors in space, well, the vectors live where? Kiana. Where do the vectors live? Do they live in the space or do they live in the? Um, you got help down there? So far. Tangent space? Yeah, the vectors live in tangent space. And the tangent space is defined at each point. So if you're comparing vectors at two different points in the space, you're comparing vectors in two different tangent spaces. And guess what? Those tangent spaces do not have to be parallel or aligned with each other in any way. Okay? So, we can actually formalize this to get some really useful machinery out of the covariant derivative. But let's start by considering <laughs> That was weird. Okay, um, let's consider the normal derivative. Evaluated at the point x mu, and among other definitions, you should have seen this one. Now this is the ordinary derivative, but I just want you to notice that the vectors, this is the derivative of a vector by the way, but the, the vectors which form the numerator here, they live at different points in the space. This one lives at the point x mu, this one lives at the point x mu plus epsilon mu. Okay? So this form of the derivative doesn't really make sense, and so you might wonder, well, we've got this better form of the derivative, the del mu, and sorry, this is supposed to be mu, not mu. So we have del mu of d nu, and in this case, we have the following definition. It's fading fast. You gotta hurry up. Okay? Now what's the difference between that derivative or that definition of the derivative and the previous definition of the derivative? None. None. Exactly. <laughs> I was just testing you all. This one does have a difference though. What this means is that we take the vector as it appears at the point x mu plus epsilon mu and we transport it back to the location x mu 
When that happens, these two then live in the same tangent space, and so taking their difference makes sense. However, we aren't arbitrarily transporting this vector back, but rather we are doing it under what is called parallel transport. Okay? So we are taking the vector at x mu plus epsilon mu, and we are parallel transporting it back to the point x mu. When it gets there, these two vectors now live in the same tangent space, and so subtracting them makes sense. Okay? Subtracting two vectors that live at two different points in tangent space makes no sense. Okay? But we can obviously subtract vectors that live in the same point in tangent space. So let me give you a picture of what we mean by parallel transport. Okay? So I can imagine some vector, uh, let me see. Yeah, so I might have a vector, actually I'll do colors. I can do colors today, this is gonna be awesome. Whoops, I can drop my marker. Oh man, I hope he gets back to the black soon. Okay, so we might have a vector at this point, and this might be the value of the vector at the point x mu. And on the other hand, we might have the vector at this point, which points up, and this is the value of the vector at x mu plus epsilon mu, okay? Now all we do is we grab this vector and we transport it down to the location of this vector, keeping the vector parallel with itself the whole way. So that when it gets to this point, and I, I hope to God I did that. Oh man, this is fading too. <laughs> awesome. I think we're just all gonna drift into no, oh that looks pretty good. I hope he gets back pretty quickly. I hope he's not in my office like painting the walls. <laughs> we wouldn't put that past him. Um, anyway, whoops, okay. Now does this idea of parallel, mode, of parallel transport of the vector make sense? It's important, at this point, both of these vectors are now at the same, in the same tangent space because they're both over the same point they point in different directions, that's fine. Their difference is what's going to be a part of the derivative. Okay? Now, we can, I guess I'm going to write with a green marker. I'm going to write with a black marker. This, this really stinks. Oh, there's a brown marker. I wonder how brown looks. <laughs> this looks awesome. <laughs> I'm going to lecture with this marker right here. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to finish the lecture with this marker. So. We can define parallel transport <laughs> with the covariant. It's funny, like, they run out and the people just put them right back up there and start throwing the damn thing away. It drives me crazy. Anyway, all right, so, um, so we can define parallel transport in a functional sense rather than a pictorial sense. Okay, and of course this definition is going to make use of the covariant derivative. Okay, so let's give a definition of parallel transport. So, suppose we want to parallel transport the vector v nu along the curve x mu lambda, where lambda is just going to be a parameter of where we are on this curve. Okay. First of all, recall the directional derivative. So if we have a path which is parameterized by some parameter, say lambda, okay? This path, of course, doesn't have to be a straight line. This can be a curve. But if we have a function or we have a vector, we have whatever, and we want to take the derivative of it along that curve, then one way to evaluate this in in pre-curve uh, space land was v x mu v lambda partial mu. 
There he is. I mean, did you have one? I only had one. Yep, but I got these other ones. Okay, that's so nice. Some of them are cards. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Sir, give that man a hand. Yeah. 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 All right. Please, God, tell me who's first. Okay. So. Did you paint his office at Hopefully it does. You can just kind of look at this parallel transport stuff. It all makes sense. I instantly have it. Good. Awesome. <laughs> okay. Now you can imagine. Oh God, I'm so nervous. <laughs> you can imagine that in this more general context that we simply replace the derivative with the covariant derivative. And to notate that, we're going to call this capital D, D lambda, OK? And in its breakdown is where we're really going to see what we're changing. This is basically going to be dx mu D lambda, OK? And instead of the partial derivative, we're actually going to work with the covariant derivative, OK? So this was the directional derivative in the old landscape of flat space. This is the directional derivative in the new landscape of curved space. Or just working in curvilinear coordinates in flat space. It doesn't matter. And now, of course, since we know del mu, we can break this down um, into its final form, which is d by d lambda plus gamma mu dot dot d x mu d lambda. Okay? Because remember, del mu is d mu plus gamma dot mu dot. So if I multiply that by this, this times this just reduces to this guy. And that's why I wrote d by d lambda here. But then you get this extra piece from the Christoffel connection combined with that dx mu dx lambda. OK? Now, to parallel transport a vector along a curve, we just insist that the derivative of the vector along the curve course, d x mu d lambda del mu d mu equals what? Oh, let me pick a card. Josh. Oh, no, no, so it's not Josh. It's Benj. Benjamin. What is it equal to? So if we're parallel transporting it. If we're parallel transporting it, it should be changing, right? Right, so what should this be equal to? So what we have at the end of the day, breaking this down into its most simple form, is d v nu d lambda plus gamma nu mu rho d x mu d lambda v rho equals zero. Oh man, this marker is going too. Awesome. I know, I know, I know. Okay, this is the most uh, fleshed out version of parallel transport of a vector. That was the one that was in your room. It was in my room? Yeah, it was really bad. Oh. That's why I got other ones. <sighs> I love this. All right, well, maybe I'll go back to that blue. The purple one's pretty vibrant. Yeah, the purple's pretty, uh, the blue and purple. The blue's pretty good. Can I go blue today? The blue yeah. and purple's pretty good. Let's go blue today. All right, any questions about this idea? Yeah. So, at least in the book, it seems like parallel transport is defined a unique path. How can you parallel transport a vector? 
parallel transport defines a unique path. Well, parallel transport is going to define a unique path in a few minutes. We'll talk about that. But I can parallel transport along any path. There's a condition, an extra condition, that defines a path. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. It's basically going to define a geodesic. But right now, I can take any path I want, and I can parallel transport a vector along it. That's important. And then I'll define that path by adding in another criteria. OK? Does that make sense? Uh, let me let me cover what I'm going to talk about next, and then let me know if that doesn't make it clear. Okay, but there should be a question. We just learned how to parallel transport a vector. How do you parallel transport a tangent? Exactly. What how, is the vector the only thing that lives in tangent space? No. <laughs> Tensors live in. You know, products of tangent space and cotangent space because they have dual vector components. They can have dual vector components. So at the end of the day, uh, what we can say is the rule for parallel transport of a tensor. And fortunately, the parallel transport of a tensor, holy cow, that's beautiful. <laughs> oh my god, I'm in love. It's got to be good uh, oh wow. Sorry. Uh, and I'm just going to do the simplest tensor. That's a T alpha beta, just with one up and one down, one vector and one dual vector index. Because once you've got that, you know how to do anything. OK? And we can just follow along with this story. Because in particular, we know how the dual vector is going to play into it. Okay, remember last time we talked about how the covariant derivative acts on any tensor, and it turns out, this is what we kind of finished with, was we get the derivative of the tensor components plus gamma And then uh, that's for the vector index, and then minus gamma for the dual vector index. OK? So if I just want to do a vector, I can just ignore this beta term, ignore this term, and then I have the rule for a vector. If I just want to do a dual vector, I can ignore the, the alpha term. All right? Now, now, one use of this is if I gave you a path and the value of T alpha beta at some point along the path, say lambda naught, okay? Then what you can do is you can solve this differential equation for the parallel transported version of that tensor all along the path. Okay? I mean, this is a differential equation, and if I set it to zero to define parallel transport, okay, and I guess we should say this is equal to zero, Sorry. OK. This differential equation, if I give you the path and a, a set of initial or boundary conditions, then the unknown is the parallel transported components of the tensor along the path. OK? I mean, this is the same thing and you can do with any differential equation. You can pick what you're going to provide, and then that might change what the unknown is. All right. So let's see what we can do with parallel transport. Turns out there are three useful things that parallel transport does for us. A, it's actually part of the derivative, the covariant derivative. Remember, I define the covariant derivative as the difference in the vector quantity between two points. Well, that's using a parallel transport, so in a sense, Parallel transporting is part of the formal definition of the covariant derivative. 
Okay, that's kind of obvious. This might not be so obvious. It helps detect curvature. Let me give you an example. Okay, so let's imagine that we are in a space with no curvature. What might I call that space? What? Well, no, 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 I mean a formal name. R2, yeah, we'll, we'll call it R2. And let me just see whose card I've got next. Okay. So if I'm in R2, which is flat space, and I imagine a path in R2, and I start with a vector that say points in that direction, and then I parallel transport the vector along the path, notice, Vector just keeps pointing in the same direction. Okay? More importantly, however, if I transport it around a close path, and my vector starts out like this, and I parallel transport it all the way around the circle. It ends up pointing in exactly the same direction that it started. Make sense? Make sense? Good. Now, but <laughs> let's now consider a curve space. Let's take a point at the North Pole. Let's draw a curve which goes down to the equator, walks around the equator a bit, and then heads back up to the North Pole. And let's start with a vector which is parallel to the path. If I bring it down, parallel transporting it so that it remains parallel to itself, it gets to the equator pointing in that direction. If I move around the equator, keeping it parallel to itself, it ends up like that. And if I carry it back to the North Pole, whoops, keeping it parallel to itself, holy shit. Did it come back to the North Pole pointing in the same direction? No, it did not. Is this a curved space? Yes, it is. OK. So by parallel transporting at least a vector, a scalar won't do anything. A tensor will just carry more information. A vector is sort of the minimal thing you need to do this to. By transporting a vector around a closed path and comparing the initial vector to the parallel transported vector, if they are different, then that is telling you the space is curved. If they are the same, it's telling you it might be flat, but it might not be flat. Because notice, if we had started here, and we had gone all the way around the equator, how would we have ended up? We would have ended up the same. That doesn't mean this space is flat. You're just picking a particular curve to go around, OK? But what I really want you to pay attention to, though, is if the vector changes around the closed path, that means there is curvature in your space. And we will use that in part to define a curvature measure that will be a very critical part of Einstein's equations. Okay? In due time, though. Then there's C. C is that it helps define Geodesic path. Okay. This looks a little bit weird. 
sorry. Oh, that's fine. Okay, now we're going to use the parallel transport to define our geodesic path in just a minute, but before that I've got to introduce one more idea. Okay, but how many of you remember the role that geodesic paths play in general relativity? What's the role? It's the trajectory of an unaccelerated particle, right? Yeah, so this is the trajectory. This is basically the equation which is analogous to Newton's second law. This is the equation that tells us how particles react to the curved background. Okay? So it is an essential piece of the story. We have Einstein's equation, which tells us how the sources distort the geometry. And then we have the geodesic equation, which says, okay, fine, the geometry is weird. How does that, how does that affect the behavior of particles? The geodesic equation tells us that. And we're going to get the geodesic equation today. Okay? So... Directional covariant derivative, the covariant derivative, parallel transport, <coughs> the differences path. I mean, so I'll, I'll just quickly ask this. Does everybody appreciate the difference between this derivative and this derivative? They're related, this is part of this, but does everybody appreciate the difference between this and this? Does anybody want me to explain it? Okay, this is the coordinate derivative of the vector. That's saying take the vector at a point x mu and then shift all of the coordinates by a certain amount. Okay? This is the derivative along a particular path in space-time. That's why there's no vector here. It's just the, it's it's just how does this quantity vary as we move along the path parameterized by lambda? Does that make sense? So this is telling me, you know, if you have a coordinate system and you've got the, the vector v mu here, how it changes in this direction, this direction, and this direction, because that's what this mu index is telling me. And mu equals zero is telling me how it changes in the time direction. Mu equals one is telling me how it changes in the x direction, et cetera, et cetera. Here, though, I just have a path, which is parameterized by lambda. And this is telling me how v nu changes as I move along the path. Are we clear on that? OK, all right, I'm not going to do this sort of mini review. OK, so let's go on to geodesics. <coughs> So there are two ways to define a geodesic path. We might call them geo. So one, we can define them as curves, x mu lambda, which extremize distance between two points. How many of you have heard of a geodesic defined in this way? Raise your hand. Yeah, if you're familiar with geodesic, it's usually the shortest path between two points or something like that, right? Note, I didn't say shortest. I said extra mice. Okay? 
I know what you're thinking. <laughs> What's the longest path between point A and point B? <sighs> we'll figure that out in a minute. But two, yet another way, is to say that geodesics are curves which parallel transport their own tangent vectors. This is that additional criterion which is going to let me use parallel transport to define a particular path. And we're going to see an example of this. Okay? So as usual, let me give you a pictorial explanation, starting in our favorite space of all, R2. It's so boring in R2. So imagine the path between point A and point B, which extremizes the distance along the path. What do you think? Largest or smallest is going to be relevant in this case? Hopefully smallest. Smallest. And what is that path? A straight line. It's a straight line. Exactamondo. OK? That's how easy it is. Damn. Well, that's definition A. OK? So in definition A, this thing is identified as a geodesic path. But let's use definition B to verify it. The tangent to the path as it goes through A is this vector right here. If I parallel transport that, remains tangent to the path. Does that make sense? Just to drive the point home, consider a different path between point A and point B. Is that a geodesic? No, it's not. Let's show that by the second definition. If I take the tangent to the path at A and I parallel transport it, is this thing remaining tangent to the path? No. Everybody see that? Obviously, if I take any path except for this one, this is going to play a role. At some point along that path, the vector will no longer be tangent to the path. It might be tangent to the path for most of it, but at some point, it will not be tangent to the path. That's it for parallel transporting. Okay. All right, now I'm going to really drive this point home. You ready? This is going to seem repetitive at first, but just give me a second. Point A and my path is going to be around the circle, and maybe I'm just going to point B. Okay. If I take the tangent vector to the path and I parallel transport it, is the path from A to B a geodesic? No, it's not. I'm going to drive the point home. I'm going to do it again.
This time, the space is the circle. If I want to parallel transport this vector to this point, in what direction must that vector point? Tangent to the circle. Because the vector must live in tangent space, so the tangent to points on the circle are tangent to the circle. So even though I'm parallel transporting it, it must do this. And it must do this. And it must do this. Well, let me ask you a really stupid question. What's the shortest distance between points A and points B? It's this curve. Because this space doesn't exist. The only thing that exists is the circle. So in this context, going from A to B has the shortest path, which is along this curve. And that is in complete agreement with the fact that the tangent vector parallel transported remains tangent to the path. Everybody on board? All right, good. All right. Are there any questions about this? Uh, now I'm going to actually go through and give you a formula for, oh yeah, go for it. You made the distinction earlier between saying the shortest path and hex minus. Yes. What is the difference? In I'm going to tell you in a few minutes. Okay. I'm going to give you an example. Okay. Yes. How does um, taking the other path around, so let's say we want to go to A to B. So th this is a topologically non-trivial thing. Okay. So this is an example where if I had A here and B down here, there could be two geodesics, that's fine. That's, but that's a topological thing. Just imagine that this circle, I mean, just imagine that the circle was actually a semicircle, you know, just to cut out that extraneous piece, but that, that's a topological thing. Okay, are there any other questions about this before we go on? And I will get to that in a few minutes. Okay. So let me give a mathematical definition of a geodesic bound. I mean, pictures are great, they help your understanding, but you need an equation. Um, so first of all, recall a path x mu parametrized by lambda has components d x mu d lambda of its tangent vector. So we identified this a couple of lectures ago. These are the components of the tangent vector. And now, if the path is geodesic, then the components should be Annabelle's. <laughs> should be the root center to the centers? Yes. Okay. If this path is geodesic, then the components of the tangent vector should be what? Should they change? No. 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 Because remember, if, along with geodesic, if you're parallel transporting something, it remains tangent to the path. So 
how can we specify that it's not changing? What derivative? Yeah, yeah. So what we can say in words is that this should be covariantly constant. Along the curve. I.e. parallel. Let's actually do this. So what we can say is x mu of lambda is a geodesic path if the derivative along the curve of the components of the tangent vector, so this is the covariant directional derivative of the components of the tangent vector, this should equal what? And above. I'm so sorry, I was talking down the list. Please repeat the question. So the path x mu lambda is a geodesic if the covariant derivative of the components of the tangent vector equals what? Zero. Exactly. I'm always asking you these things. There you go. Nice. Okay? So let's break this down. So we can break down the d by d lambda into dx mu d lambda del nu, oh sorry, dx nu d lambda del nu. Okay, that's just d by d lambda. And then we're taking the derivative of the components of the tangent vector. Okay. Now let's scramble this up a bit. Let's put in our definition of the covariant derivative. was I put in the form of the covariant derivative and I let it act on these components. Okay. And now we can do a little bit of massaging and we find that this takes the form d2 x mu d lambda squared plus gamma mu nu alpha d x nu d lambda d x alpha Lambda. Okay. And this defines for us a geodesic path. This is the most functional form of the equation for a geodesic path. So this is the one that you want to write down and put a block around it because this is the one we're going to use most often. You might wonder where did this d squared x u, where did this come from? This is written in my notes. It's just one step, but I'm not going to lay it out for you. You can just look it up. Okay, there's a little bit of massaging that goes on going from the above equation to the below equation. Now, to use this, first of all, note it's a second order equation. So how many boundary conditions are we going to need? Two. Okay. So what we could do is we could give you okay we could give you uh, we could give you the position uh, at some point with the velocity, or the components of the tangent vector, at that same point. And this generates the geodesic which is launched from the point described by that parameterized point lambda naught. Okay? Alternatively, and this will be more familiar to you. We 
we could just give you the position at two different points and you can solve for the path between them. Okay? This is the problem which reflects what I had up here for A. That is, the geodesic path extremizes the distance between points. Okay? Now, I want you to notice Christoffel symbols, they differ for different geometries. They also differ by the coordinate system that you use. But here's the thing, if you're working in flat space and you're using Cartesian coordinates, what are the Christoffel symbols if you're using Cartesian coordinates in flat space, Andrew? Sure. Christoffel symbols if you're in flat space using Cartesian coordinates, X, Y, Z. What are these gammas? Can I try it? No. <laughs> well, unless, unless Matt needs you. Go for it. Go for it, Ross. Zero. There's zero. Remember, flat space in Cartesian coordinates is so simple that the, all the gammas are zero and the derivative is just the derivative. The covariant derivative is just the derivative. However, what if we're in flat space and we're working with polar coordinates? Are the gammas zero? No. What if you're in flat space and you're solving for the extremal distance between two points? Does it matter whether you use Cartesian or polar coordinates? It doesn't matter. In one situation, with Cartesian coordinates, you'll use this equation, but this term will contribute. In the polar coordinate situation, you'll use the same equation with these terms, and you'll get the same answer. All right. So here's an intuitive example. I don't know what's going on there. Um, here's an intuitive example. Uh, in R3, with x, y, and z, where the gammas are zero, Our geodesic equation becomes d2 x mu d lambda squared equals zero. Okay, which hopefully we can solve. Okay. What kind of path is this? Epsilon mu and the x naught mu are going to be set by the boundary condition. And then lambda is just the parameterization. But that's what we would expect in R3. A geodesic path in R3 is just a straight line. Okay? Okay. Now, I am about to take advantage of the fact that you have all taken intermediate mechanics. Because part of the definition of a geodesic is that it extremizes the distance between two points. Extremizes. Where did you see that in intermediate mechanics? Lagrangians. The Lagrangian. Okay. It turns out that we can write this problem in pretty much an identical fashion to the Lagrangian. So let's do that. And I know I'm going to regret erasing all this, but that's just what we have to deal with. Okay. So here we go. Again, I'm going to pick a simple space, but this time I'm going to work with R and theta so that we actually have our Christoffels. So remember the, the interval squared is dr squared plus r squared d theta squared. And if you calculate the Christoffel connection, 
coefficients, you get gamma r theta theta is minus r, and gamma theta theta r, which is of course the same as gamma theta r theta, is one over r. Now I'm going to take a path. Which has R changing with lambda and beta changing with lambda. Okay. And then what we're going to do is for this parameter lambda, we're going to use that lambda equals the distance along the path. This is the same way we're par parametrizing things in special relativity. Okay, remember we wanted to parametrize the motion of something, but T wouldn't work because T wasn't an invariant. So we ended up parametrizing the path by the length of the path, and that's what we're going to use in this case. So we're going to use for our parameter lambda the length along the path. So we have x mu of s is r s theta s. And then the total length. given by S A to B is the integral from point A to point B of DS, which I can write as the integral from A to B of the square root of DS squared Okay, but I can write this in the following form. Now what we want to do is we want to extremize this length. Remember what we're doing, we're going to find a geodesic path between A and B. This is maybe not a geodesic, okay? But one definition of a geodesic path is that it extremizes the distance between point A and point B. So here is an arbitrary path and an expression for the length of the path. We want to extremize this. Well, holy shit, what does this look like? What if S was T? You guys seem so nervous. Lagrangian? Would that be just T along the path? Would that be a neato Lagrangian? Yeah, it's just a Lagrangian. Okay. Where we know that for a normal Lagrangian, where things are in terms of time, this gives us the Euler-Lagrange equation. And I'm not actually going to go through extremizing it, we're just going to jump to this result. Okay, so if I have a Lagrangian, which is a function of the coordinates and their velocities, and it's integrated with respect to time, then we get this set of differential equations. Now I can come back and I can say, okay, this is my Lagrangian integrated over the distance s, but it's built from the coordinates and derivatives of the coordinates. Okay? So if we call dr ds vr and d theta ds v theta, just to drive the analogy home. Okay. Then we can apply these equations, except instead of t, we're going to use s. Instead of v, we're going to use d theta ds or dr ds. Does everybody see the analogy playing out here? I mean, in the end, this doesn't have to be a physical system. This is just an object that we're extremizing using variational calculus. We can, we can put this in any context, as long as it roughly takes this form. OK? 
Okay? And this is definitely taking this form. So if we do this, and I'm going to come up here to do it. Then we get the following. D by DS partial L partial DR minus partial L partial R and D by DS partial L partial theta minus partial L partial theta. Okay, exactly analogous to these. Everybody see that? Okay. Now if I actually do this with that Lagrangian, we're going to get D2 D or D2R DS squared. Or sorry, yeah, 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 I'm doing it with Lagrangian. Minus R D theta DS squared. And that has to be zero. And then for the theta, D2 theta DS squared plus 2 over R DR ds, d theta, ds, equals zero. Okay? We all on board? That's literally just taking this guy and performing these derivatives. Okay? Maximizing L, which is just the distance. We need to compare this to something. So let's compare it to what we get when we apply the geodesic equation. Notice, in this analysis, I never used the Christoffel connection. This is just an extremization question. But with the geodesic equation, which should give me the same thing, I'm going to make use of the Christoffel connection. Okay? So if we bang this out, this is going to give us d2r ds squared plus gamma r theta theta d theta ds squared. And it's also going to give us d2 theta ds squared plus <coughs> gamma theta theta r d theta s d theta ds dr ds plus gamma theta r theta dr ds d theta ds. I'm just plugging in the only non-zero values for the Christoffel connection coefficient. Okay. Well, what are they? Well, this is d2r ds squared. What's that one? Say it again. This one? What's this one? Are these two terms the same? Anybody see any difference between these equations? So I'm just trying to drive the point home 
that these two different definitions of the geodesic are going to give us the same thing. Okay? Now I'm going to answer your question. Because every example I've given you has been in R2, Euclidean space. And one of the things we know about Euclidean space is that the length of any vector, the square of the length of any vector is, well, it's invariant, but it's also positive. In Lorentzian space, that's in a space like the Minkowski space of special relativity, vectors can have a length which is positive, negative, or zero. Zero even when they're not zero. Okay? So now let us turn to Minkowski space and ask, well, how the hell does this extremization thing play out? First of all, recall that the length of a path from point A to point B, if it's a timeline path, is the square root of minus ds squared. The integral of the square root of minus ds squared. Why minus ds squared? Warren! Are you there? Who's up? Yeah. Why is that negative there? That's a great question. In Minkowski space in four dimensions, for a time-like path, what is ds squared for a time-like path? Is it positive, negative, or zero? It's is negative. Is it positive? No, it's negative. So ds squared itself will be negative, but of course to get the square root to make sense, we're going to multiply it by a minus sign. Okay? So I want you to think that what I've written up there is imaginary. For time-like paths, and these are the paths traveled by things that have mass, for time-like paths, this quantity is positive. Does this make sense? Okay? Now, here's what we're going to play out. We're going to draw a simple picture with an x and a t-axis. We're going to have a t-naught. We're going to have a t-mid. And we're going to have a t-final. OK? This is point A. This is point B. All right? And by the way, we're going to be in two-dimensional Minkowski space, just to make life simple. So ds squared is minus dt squared plus dx squared. OK? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to consider two paths between a and b. First of all, there's the simple path, straight up. And then I'm going to define another path. which goes out to some point, x mid, and then turns around and comes right back. OK? Drew, which of those paths is longer? So let's calculate the length of path u. So the length of the path according to u is simply the integral from t naught to t final of dt squared because if 
you're moving along path u, you don't move in the x direction at all. So dx squared does not contribute. Okay. So ds squared is just minus dt squared. Of course, with the minus, that makes this plus dt squared squared, which is dt. Sorry, this should be dt, not dt squared. I got a pair in my notes. Who can do that integral for me? Go for it, Josh. Tf minus t naught? Yeah, this is Tf minus t naught. Pretty straightforward, right? Yeah, I know, give my hand. Okay, now let's do the path from A to B along path V. So first of all, this is the integral from A to B of dt squared minus dx squared. Okay, where remember I put a minus in front of ds squared, so that changes the sign of each of these. Now, these are going to take two parts. There's this leg and then there's this leg, and we can just break up the integral. Well, first of all, let me rewrite the integral. So let me say that the integral, if I do that tricky thing where I just factor out a dt squared, then this just becomes 1 minus dx squared integrated with respect to dt, okay? Because if I just pull out a dt, then this becomes dt squared over dt squared, which is 1, and this becomes dx squared over dt squared, which is dx squared, okay? And now what I can do is I can say, okay, this is the integral from 0 to the middle time of 1 minus dx squared dt plus the integral from the middle time to the final time of 1 minus minus vx squared dt. Because clearly the way I've drawn these, this is going to have a velocity which is positive, and this is going to have the same speed, but a velocity which is negative. Okay? Just for simplicity. All right? Of course, those two integrands end up being the same. So this is the integral from 0 to tf of 1 minus vx squared dt. Everybody follow? Cameron, are you ready? How does this compare to this? Bigger, smaller, or equal? You mean bigger? Bigger? Or no, smaller? Well, what is this number? Is this? That will be less than one. This will be less than one. Otherwise, this is an integral over dt. So this is just the integral over dt. This is the integral of 1 over dt. This is the integral of a function, but it's always less than 1. So this is always going to be less than this. Go for it, Sam. Shouldn't the limit be from t0 to 0? Sorry. Uh oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. t0. Are you a little bit surprised? We just proved that this path is shorter than this one. Now, what about this path? Bigger or shorter than this one? Shorter. shorter. What about this path? Now it's longer. You're going to ruin your marker. <laughs> what about that path? Bigger or shorter than this one? Shorter. Shorter. Well, hold on. Is this a geodesic? Yes. Yes, it is. Does it correspond to the shortest distance between two points? No, it doesn't. It corresponds to what? The longest. The longest distance between two points. 
answer your question? That's why we have to use the word extramides. Because in certain geometries, like Euclidean space, the geodesic is the shortest distance between two points. But in a Lorentzian signature space, like Minkowski space, the geodesic path is the largest length path between two points. By the way, can anybody tell me what story from special relativity this explains? The twin paradox? Say it again, the twin paradox? The twin paradox. Which one is older? The one that didn't uh, move. The one that didn't move. He lived along a longer path than this guy did. Josh, you got a question? Uh, yeah, if the shortest path is just you traveling at the speed of light from somewhere to somewhere else, how the hell do you get from to a TF to a different time? Say this again? I mean, well, I mean, we should be careful. I mean, actually, yeah, I should be a bit careful. Um, this path is actually, depending on how I view it, this path is actually traveling, traveling super luminally. I should have done. Oh, okay. Like, I should have done something like this. Okay. okay. I got you. But no, no, no. If I if I did this, and this is exactly has the slope of one, and this has the slope of minus one, then what speed am I traveling at? The speed of light. I'm traveling at the speed of light. What's v s squared for light? It's zero. zero. All right, so um, I think that's actually where I'm going to end it today, because the next page is a big breakthrough. Do recall um, that we are going to have a quiz on Tuesday. Okay, Madison and I will both have our office hours Monday and Tuesday to get, and I'll send you an email letting you know when those are going to be, but we'll have office hours on Monday and Tuesday. Madison's office hours on Tuesday are going to be analogous to her regular office hours on Thursday from 3 to 5. And I know that that's going to conflict with the colloquium, but that's the way it is. I'll let you know when my office hours are going to be ASAP by an email, okay? This is a very long homework assignment, so go ahead and get started, all right? It's not hard, it's just long, because we're really embracing these calculations, okay? <laughs> And I might add, and let me actually say this before you guys depart because it hasn't struck me yet, but I want to go ahead and tell you. Obviously, when you start working with four by four matrices and tensors and so forth and so on, you are not going to want to do things by hand. So we're going to call into play Mathematica or whatever computing computational tool you like. However, when you use Mathematica, there is a package that you can use which just simply calculates everything that you need to know. You type in a metric and it gives you everything you need to know. Okay? It's called the great package. You might find better packages out there. I don't care. Great's the one that I'm familiar with and I use and all my solutions will be in terms of great notebooks. Okay, but very quickly things are just going to blow up so badly. I mean, we've got these Christoffel connections which have three indices. That means in four dimensions, how many components do we have? Yes. Yes. Okay. So you're going to want to use Mathematica for some of the problems in this homework assignment. Um, we will be available to help you out um, should you need it. All right. But we're definitely going to turn to Mathematica towards the end of this course because things are just going to get way out of control. Okay. Any questions? Oh, sorry. Are we going to be using Mathematica on our quizzes? On, our, on your quizzes? No, you won't need Mathematica on a quiz. Okay.